Chapter 23. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom perseveres the life of its possessor. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. Alcyon cuts rapidly through the swirling onrush of water. We are in Prince William Sound, traversing one of its narrower waterways. Here in the Northwestern Territories of Australia, the tidal flows are incredibly swift. The water can rise or fall up to 33 feet in six hours. The resulting tidal currents are so swift, particularly in these restricted channels, they create massive whirlpools. We are passing one just off to our starboard side. The whirlpool is at least 50 feet across with a swirling funnel that is fully five feet deep. I stare nervously at the swirling vortex of water because one of our zodiacs is headed right for it. Surprisingly, this is no accident. Two of our divers, Mark and Thierry, are taking turns blasting through the edges of the whirlpools with the zodiacs racing at full speed. They are both young men and find adventure in taking measured risks. I would prefer that they didn't go quite so close to the dangerous swirling water. Despite the daily risks we take on these expeditions, I am often referred to as the overprotective mother hen. I worry for the safety of my divers. And right now, Thierry is giving me something very real to worry about. At 30 miles an hour, he drops into the center of a massive whirlpool. For a heart-stopping moment, the small inflatable all but disappears from sight. Then noise high, nose high, it shoots nearly vertical out of the swirling pocket and goes bouncing out into smoother water. Apparently, that daring move has ended their game. Thierry and Mark return to the stern of the windship. Recovering the returning zodiacs while Alcyon is racing at full speed is always an interesting and challenging feat. On the port side stern of the windship, there is a ramp that goes down to the water. Anton, Capkin, and I at the sides of the ramp, ready to catch the first incoming zodiac. It is an interesting experience to see an inflatable boat hurling at you, knowing your job is to try to catch it. Mark makes the first run. The wind ship is racing at 15 miles an hour against a current flowing at 6 miles an hour. Mark is charging the stern at about 25 miles an hour. The zodiac hits the ramp hard, sliding forward 15 feet as we pounce on it. Removing the outboard engine and lifting out the fuel tank takes less than a minute. Then we prepare to receive the second Zodiac. This maneuver is much more tricky. Our ramp is short and narrow, so we must stack the inflatable boats one on top of the other. Mark has landed the smaller of the two Zodiacs, which the four of us now lift up and hold on our shoulders. Thierry's job is to make a high-speed deposit of his larger Zodiac underneath the smaller one we are lifting. Considering that the Zodiac we are holding up weighs over 200 pounds, it is important that Thierry lands his boat quickly. Anton offers a bit of encouragement. Hurry up! My grandmother could park it faster than you. With the first boat balanced on our shoulders, I see Thierry grinning wickedly as he hurls at us with the throttle almost wide open. An instant later, the bow hits the ramp, bounces up and slams all the way to the back of the ramp. I look down at the Zodiac abruptly resting at my feet. There is less than a two-inch gap between my legs and the inflatable boat. We quickly secure both Zodiacs. Sometimes we leave one of the Zodiacs tied to the stern. However, we are about to go up the Prince Regent River. Captain did not think 
it would be a good idea to leave a rubber boat in the water since this river is a home for saltwater crocodiles. I quickly hustle to the bow as we head for the river mouth. I'm about to see an amazing sight. The tidal outf outflow is at its peak, which means the water level is falling about eight feet an hour. To our port sides closer to shore, there is an exposed reef with a broad tidal waterfall flowing vigorously down its side. The reef has a flat table-like top, and the seawater is cascading down multiple levels back to the sea. An ocean waterfall is something I never expected to see. As Alcyon begins her journey up the river, the water turns a muddy brown. Anxiously, I watch the shore, eager for my first sight of a saltwater crocodile. Unfortunately, over the next two hours, I don't see a single crocodile. Not that they are not about. It is just they that they hear the wind ship's engines coming and have learned to duck out of sight. I pause to wipe the sweat off my face. Australian summers get really hot. It is 114 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. So I go below deck to the dive locker to cool off and get some work done. Late in the afternoon, the whole crew is on deck as we round a final bend in the river and arrive at King's Cascade. We find a safe place to anchor, not far from a crudely painted sign on the rocks that forbids swimming because of crocodiles. No kidding, I think to myself. Nicholas, Alcyon's captain, paces the deck. He's not comfortable anchoring for the night in this tiny inlet. Even though our government guide assures us the tidal change will not be any greater than 10 feet this far up the river, the captain decides to take some precautions. He has Thierry and Mark attach mooring lines to the rocky cliffs and around a tree on the shore. This is to ensure the wind ship's safety and to keep us over a flat mud bottom just in case the government man is wrong about the amount of tidal change this far up river. We no sooner finish when I see my first crocodile. Actually, there are two of them lying on a distant rock. For a moment, I pause to think of the young American film actress who lost her life here. As the day begins to fade towards twilight, I'm distracted from my thoughts by the sound of the chef ringing the dinner bell. Capkin, of course, beats, beats me below deck. At the dinner table, most of the conversation centers around salt, saltwater crocodiles. Our guide explains that they are the largest reptiles in the world and can grow to lengths of 18 feet or more. Because of overhunting, they became an endangered species here. But now that they're protected, they are making a rapid recovery. The guide is just explaining how they work together to rip apart their prey when the saloon lights abruptly fade and the ship goes dark. If this is a joke, it's not funny, Capkin states in a flat voice around a mouthful of food. Two crewmen race into the engine room while the race while the rest of us surge up onto the deck. We are astonished to discover that the water in the little bay is almost completely gone, but for a puddle under the waterfall. The wind ship is settled onto the muddy bottom. The soft mud is so deep that Alcyon is still perfectly level. A moment later, one of the engineers arrives to report that the ship's generators shut down because of a lacking of cool water. The captain looks at our government guide and shakes his head. The outgoing tide dropped the water level here a full 28 feet. Looks like we're stuck here for at least the next six hours without lights or power. The captain is far from happy. 
Capkin plays a flight flashlight beam along the shoreline. Numerous pairs of close-set reptilian eyes reflect the light in a hellish red glow. I guess they're making a comeback, declares Captain. Look at all those buggers. The guide is looking at the deck in shame as he says. You should know that crocodiles have been known to climb onto boat decks, particularly late at night. Well, that's a cheery thought, I reply. Theory, theory reaches over and closes the access gate to the stern. I don't think I'll be sleeping on deck tonight, he states wistfully. And it's going to be really hot below without air conditioning. Well, since we're not going anywhere, Captain says, heading back below, I think I'll go finish my dinner. Most of us have trouble sleeping that night in the sweltering heat. So we gather in the saloon under the soft glow of candlelight, share the scariest stories we know. Occasionally we would hear a loud thump of some something banging against the outside hall. But none of us volunteered to go outside to see what it was.